This is Off the Cuff, and I'm Steve from TorahFamily.org. It wasn't too long ago that my wife listened to a podcast discussing people who believed in pursuing the Torah. That would be my family. So I obviously wanted to hear it. As I sat there listening, Angela and I looked at each other multiple times in disbelief of what we were hearing. It got so bad that I decided to make this formal reply to it. This will be the first of several parts. The podcast was from livingwaters.com. The episode was titled, The Hebrew Roots Movement, Their Dangerous Beliefs, and Why You Need to Know Them. It was episode number 70. This podcast was filled with so many errors, I just couldn't let it go. The link to the podcast is in the description below. The hosts of the show were interviewing an author named Rob Solberg. Mr. Solberg is a professor of theology and philosophy at Williamson College in Tennessee. Mr. Solberg is the one who claims to have created the word Torahism. In fact, he says the following in the interview as to why this term was needed. Torahism is really, like you said, it's a term I coined because there isn't one out there for this umbrella of belief systems that simply say the one common thread is that Christians, so followers of Christ, are required to keep the law of Moses, meaning all the Old Testament laws, the feasts, the kosher food, um, all that kind of stuff. So, most often, people hear it called Hebrew roots. People call themselves often Torah keepers, Torah observant Christians. I've even had some folks call themselves Messianic Christians. But it's all simply centered around the idea that Christians today need to keep the entire law of Moses. So, by his own admission, there actually are terms given for this belief system but he still felt the need to make his own term. Though he said there's no term for this belief system, what does the Bible call this belief system? Paul said it had a name and spelled it out even. Acts 24.14 However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. So Paul called it the way, living in agreement with the law and the prophets. As covered in our teaching, no law, no light, Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8 says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. What was the word of God to Isaiah? The Torah. The Torah stands forever. This is why Isaiah said what he did when speaking of the future kingdom under Yeshua's reign. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And that is why we see this in Isaiah chapter 51. Listen to me, my people. Hear me, my nation. The law will go out from me. My justice will become a light to the nations. So his ways from chapter 2 is equated as the light here in chapter 51. The psalmist equally says his word is the light, just the same. His word, the law, will become a light to the nations because it is the light. The nations just haven't acknowledged it as such yet. But that day will come when Yeshua reigns from Jerusalem in the millennial kingdom. In that day, the nations will see that his law is and has always been the light. Now, some might say, 
wait a minute. Jesus said he is the light of the world. Absolutely. He lived the law flawlessly for all to see. Yeshua also said this in John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, he's the way, truth, and the life. Now, please consider what the scriptures say the Torah is. Deuteronomy 11.26-28 says it's the way. Torah is the way. Psalm 119 says it's the truth. Torah is the truth. Deuteronomy 32 says it's the life. Torah is the life. The very things Yeshua himself said he was, Torah is. So, Mr. Solberg, besides the terms you already admitted that others were calling this way of life, there's actually three biblical terms for this belief system. The way, the truth, and the life. All referencing the Torah. All centered on the idea that believers today need to keep the law of Moses as Yeshua did. When one walks in obedience to Yeshua, you're walking in obedience to the Torah. When one walks in obedience to the Torah, you're walking in obedience to to Yeshua. A little later, Mr. Solberg says the following, So, 100% of the Torahists I've talked to are Gentiles. There are no Jewish people who would say, who would take this position. I've got friends who are Messianic Jews, a local congregation in Nashville, and they're like, Gentiles were never under the covenant. Why would someone possibly think they need to be keeping the law of Moses? Mr. Solberg and his friends couldn't be more wrong. In the account of the Exodus out of Egypt, we read where there were many others who left Egypt with the 12 tribes of Israel. This alone shows it's not only Hebrews who were given the Torah. Mr. Solberg's friends said, Gentiles were never under the covenant. Why would someone possibly think they need to be keeping the law of Moses? Well, first, Mr. Solberg and his friends need to remember biblical history. The term Gentile is a reference to one who isn't a Jew. A Jew is one who is from the land of Judea. Who is that? As a whole, it was the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, also known as the Southern Kingdom of Israel. Mr. Solberg's friends is saying that only the Southern Kingdom of Israel was given the covenant at Mount Sinai. However, on the day of the covenant, we see all 12 tribes were present. And all of Numbers chapter 2 shows all 12 tribes encamped around the tent of meeting. Those who believe the misconception that Israel is only made up of Jews is completely ignoring biblical history. All 12 tribes were given the Torah. The ten tribes of the northern kingdom rebelled first. They were also known as Ephraim. They were later banished to Assyria. They never came back to the land of Israel after their banishment. They ended up assimilating into the nations. The southern kingdom also rebelled and was banished to Babylon. However, they returned after 70 years. The northern kingdom never returned but spread throughout the nations, whereas that of the southern kingdom did come back to the land. And now we're seeing the nations return to the Torah just as Moses prophesied would happen in the last days. So, knowing biblical history is very important here. First, we see there were many others who joined Israel when leaving Egypt. So it wasn't just the Hebrews who were given the Torah, as shown in Exodus 12. Then we see how all 12 tribes received the Torah and not only Judah and Benjamin, as shown in Exodus 24. 
And then we see how those of the northern kingdom who were scattered among the nations would return to obedience to Yahweh in the last days, as shown in Deuteronomy 4. So Mr. Solberg and his friends are wrong. Non-Jewish people were given the Torah. The many others who left Egypt with Israel and the ten tribes who weren't living in the land of Judea, thus they weren't Jews, had the Torah given to them just the same. Mr. Solberg says this regarding what he believes has led people to pursuing the Torah. And they're thinking to themselves, I want to go deeper. I want to understand the ancient sense of my faith. Now, why do they do that? I've got some theories that I have not confirmed. What? He questions why they want to go deeper? They want to go deeper in their relationship with Yahweh, and he considers this odd? I call it seeking Yahweh with all their heart and soul, as shown earlier from Moses. Just like we see in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, we're told to seek him with everything, which is also mentioned in Deuteronomy 11:18. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Well, what words? The Torah. Thus, Yeshua's response in Luke chapter 10, Luke 10, 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Remember, the question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. <laughs> Straight from the Torah. Straight from the Torah. And what was Yeshua's reply? Do this, and you will live. Do this and you will live. Do what? Follow the Torah. How can Yeshua say this? Because it's what the Torah says. Deuteronomy 30, 15. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. Now pause here a moment. This is at the end of Deuteronomy. He just gave them the law. What they do with it decides what they receive from it. Life and prosperity or death and destruction. Verse 16, For I command you today to love Yahweh your God. Now let's pause again. How do we love Yahweh? He then shows us how in the following words. To walk in his ways and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and Yahweh your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter, and possess. Thus, Yeshua's words, do this and you will live. But that's not all of it. Look what Moses said in the next verse. Verse 19, this day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Heaven and earth are witnesses. Sound familiar? It should. This is why Yeshua said this in Matthew 5.18. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now, if you're under the belief that Yeshua did away with the law because he said he 
fulfilled it in verse 17, then you have to believe he also did away with all righteousness as that was what he said two chapters earlier to John the Baptist. Matthew 3.15 Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Both verses have the exact same word for fulfill. So, if you believe Yeshua did away with the Torah because of Matthew 5.17, you have to also believe that he did away with all righteousness too. However, when we realize fulfill means to live out, as seen in chapter 3, we also realize that's what it means in chapter 5. Thus, he said nothing would disappear from the law, but rather we are to live it out. If you are seriously interested, we have two teachings on this subject, abolished and heaven and earth testify. So many want to debate what Yeshua meant at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount when he said he came to fulfill the law, but didn't come to abolish it. But they completely avoid what he said near the end of that same sermon when he said, Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's what the Greek says. Workers of lawlessness. And remember, that's going to be said. Again, showing the law is how we are to be living out our love for Yahweh. A moment later in the conversation, Mr. Solberg says the following, So they want to dig into the scriptures, and they end up going too far. And they end up uh, missing the mark, assuming that everyone that follows Jesus, Yeshua Mashiach, right? So he says we're missing the mark. We must understand that Torah literally means direction or instruction and could simply refer to a parent's directive for a child. The root word, yod, resh, and he, carries the meaning to aim and to shoot an arrow, as seen here in Exodus 15.4. Exodus 19.13, 1 Samuel 20, verse 36, and 2 Kings 13.17. Torah literally means to make one move straight and true. In other words, to hit the mark. So, Mr. Solberg, please understand, those of us who are pursuing the Torah are not missing the mark, as you suggest. Those who pursue the Torah are actually hitting the mark. Those who refuse to pursue the Torah run the risk of hearing Yeshua say to them, Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Mr. Solberg then continues, He was the Jewish Messiah who taught in synagogues and all that stuff. So there is some very, there is a proper way to understand and respect the biblical Jewish roots of the Christian faith. We do not want to reject any of that. They just go too far. Mr. Solberg, please understand we are not pursuing Jewish roots. We are pursuing the faith of Abraham. Modern Christians claim Abraham is their father in the faith. They forget that the Pharisees said the same thing as seen here in John 8. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do the things Abraham did. So, what did Abraham do? He followed Yahweh's Torah as seen here in Genesis 26, 5. This is exactly what James was referencing when he said this in James 2, 24. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Let me read that one more time. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. For those truly interested, this is covered in our teaching, The Walk and Faith Alone.
Mr. Solberg, please understand, one who goes too far, as you said, is not one who pursues the Torah. We have an instruction in the Torah regarding those who go too far. Deuteronomy 12.32 See that you do all I command you. Do not add to it or take away from it. So, we are to do all he said to do. That's the word of Yahweh, which Isaiah said stands forever, which is also quoted by Peter. The Jews added to the Torah when they included the teachings from their rabbis for them to follow. In fact, we see the Pharisees held those teachings equal and even over the Torah in Mark chapter 7. Matthew 23 shows the Pharisees didn't even follow the Torah, though they taught it. That's why Yeshua could call them hypocrites like he did. They sat in Moses' seat, so they taught the Torah, but they didn't follow it. They followed their teachings passed down to them instead. And this is why the Antichrist will be called the lawless one. He will add to the Torah just as the Pharisees did. That very title given to the Antichrist should make all believers want to follow the law of Yahweh all the more. But just as the Jews added to the Torah to follow their man-made teachings, the church has taken away from the Torah to follow their man-made teachings just the same. Thus, they nullify the word of Yahweh just like the Pharisees. We cover more on this in our teaching titled, Don't Be a Judaizer. Well, that's all I have for part one. We'll continue with more in part two. Think about it. Pray about it. But more than anything, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Until next time, Shalom.